Your Honor, may I continue? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Agent Grusin, right before the break, we admitted People's 173, which you described as the defendant's written statement. And with the court's permission, I'm now going to publish that on the screen, but also ask you to read it aloud for us as we go through it. You could use the copy in front of you or read it off the screen, whichever you're more comfortable with, okay? Would you like me to read the instructions also or no? Yes, please. If you could start with the instructions. So go ahead and publish it. The appendix the free narrative describing your own words everything that occurred the day of the discipline I'm sorry <clears throat> you hadn't gotten there yet but I could sense it's coming yes sir. okay describing your own words everything that occurred the day of the disappearance from the time you got up until the time you went to sleep include everywhere you went everything you did and everyone you interacted with, whether by phone, on the computer, or in person. Take as much time as you need. No detail is too small. Everything is important. Agent Grusings, what follows the defendant's written statement that you referred to earlier? It is. Okay, if you could start walking us through this man's written statement from November 26, 2012, please. Okay, is that about the right speed? Sunday evening, I left to pick Dylan up at the airport at about 4 p.m. I wasn't sure which flight he was on, but mom told me he would arrive about 5.15 p.m. When he didn't get off the flight arriving at 5.15-ish, I waited for the next arriving flight. Mom texted me about if he arrived. I told her no. Approximately 5.50, the next flight arrived, and I meet Dylan as he entered the walkway. We left the airport and headed directly to Walmart. After I entered, I returned to get my wallet as he headed to the electronic department. After leaving Walmart, we went to, go, we went to get something to eat. I wanted a sit-down restaurant. He wanted McDonald's. We went to McDonald's and headed to the house. We carried in the groceries, and as I put them away, he went to his room to get the DVD player to watch a movie we just bought. We talked about how he was doing in school, how he was adjusting to his new environment, and seeing his friends. We started passing his football to each other, roughhoused a little, and I started to see his tension subside. It goes to page two. After watching the movie a bit, again, we started tossing the football some more. We had talked some more and he got on his computer and I remember him talking more about how he had been up till 4 a.m. the night before and how tired he was from stay at the airport most of the day. I'm guessing about 9.30 to 10 p.m., the movie ended and I went to bed. He was up, but I didn't do, I'm sorry, he was up, but I don't think it was for long, question mark. At about 5.45, I got up, and I believe this is showered, it says showed, and was trying to run my errand so we could get him to his friends. I stirred about to see if he would get up and go with me or wait. As I thought he wasn't ready to get up, so I went ahead to my office and then to my attorneys, making some calls and checking on Dylan along the way. When I returned, he had gotten up, ate some cereal, and had the TV on. At about 11.30 a.m., I called him to let him know I was home so I could take him to Bayfield. After several hours, I went to see if he was at his friend's and got no answer. So I headed to Bayfield to see if his friends had heard from him since he hadn't returned my calls. They hadn't hear from him, so I became concerned and reported my concerns to the marshal 
this mother, I believe he meant to say then mother, I immediately drove home to see if he was here again, went to his friend to be told he had not been seen. During the time the defendant was writing out this written statement, did you interrupt him at all? I did not. Any conversation taking place in the room while he's writing out this version of events? No. After he finished the written statement, did you have an opportunity to review it yourself? Yes. What were some of the details that jumped out at you in reading his own written statement? Uh, Mr. Redline was detailed uh, with times as far as the, the flights arriving, the Walmart, the DVD player. Um, the only time he mentioned guessing was he said, I'm guessing about 9.30 to 10 p.m. And then the only question that he asked was, he was up, but I don't think it was for long. So those seem to be the two vague statements, but beyond that, it seemed uh, pretty detailed. And he had mentioned rough housing and starting to see tension subside. Did you focus on those details? We talked about it, yes. We're going to get to the follow-up discussion you have with him. You mentioned the question he asked uh, about, I'm guessing about 9.30, 10 p.m. The movie ended and I went to bed. He was up, but I didn't think it was for long, question mark. Why was that significant to you, Agent Grusing, as you determined what steps to take next in the investigation? Well, it wasn't real significant to me at the time because I had not spoken with him yet. I just noted it and we continued with an interview. So after someone completes a written statement, I just asked if they're willing to talk it through with me. So that's what we did. Any detail in the written statement about saying goodnight to Dylan or how their night actually ended? There was not. Any real detail, excuse me, any real, real detail about their interaction in the morning in this written statement? He said, I stirred about to see if he would get up and go with me or wait. And that's about it. And then the other was when he returned, he had gotten up, ate some cereal, and had the TV on. Okay. Your Honor, any further inquiry along this line will we'll object. The letter speaks for itself. The, the interpretation um, violates the best evidence rule. So. Trial, and I'm not going to stop now, so we can keep going. Thank you, Your Honor. After reviewing the written statement, did you then ask the defendant some follow-up questions? I did. Where did that conversation take place, Agent Pearson? In his living room. And this was, again, on November 26, 2012? Yes. Tell the jury how the conversation went, please. I just asked Mr. Redwine to walk me through what happened. I, I leave my questions pretty open. And... Uh, he talked about uh, Dylan was supposed to arrive the previous day on the 17th, but he did not. The flight might have had mechanical issues. And then he was even supposed to arrive earlier on the 18th, but he did not arrive on time then. Did the defendant share with you any reason that he thought Dylan's arrival had been delayed? Yes. What did the defendant say? He said he thought Dylan's mother, Elaine, might be responsible for the delay. And what was the reason he offered in explaining why Dylan's mother might have been responsible for him being late in arriving in Durango? He told us that Elaine did not want uh, the defendant and Dylan to get along well, so she might have been purposely uh, keeping him from coming or delaying Dylan's coming. Did he then turn to November 18th and Dylan's arrival at the airport? Yes. What did he tell you about that? The Dylan arrived at about 5.50 p.m. Uh, Mr. Redwine picked him up. Uh, when Dylan arrived, he asked if he could go spend the night with his friend, Ryan, and he was also texting Ryan. Uh, Mr. Redwine said, no, this is a family day, and you're going to spend it with me. And Dylan seemed a little upset about this, and the, the Mr. Redwine called it standoffish in the Walmart. So. Dylan went one way to the electronics department. Uh, Mr. Redwine went the other way, and that was somewhat over the him not being able him not being able to spend the night with Ryan. What did the defendant say about 
Dylan's reaction or what Dylan did since he couldn't spend the night at Ryan Nava's in terms of making plans for the next day. He asked if he could be taken there the next morning. What did the defendant share with you about his communications with Dylan before this November trip? Mr. Redwine said that he had not spoken with Dylan for a couple of weeks prior to this visit, and that was because uh, he took a trip with Dylan to Chicago to watch a baseball game. And during that trip, uh, Mr. Redwine showed Dylan photos of what he called the windmill property. Uh, Mr. Redwine explained to us that the windmill property was where Elaine, Dylan's brother Corey, and Dylan had lived in Bayfield. And Mr. Redwine had taken pictures of the poor living conditions there. Uh, he showed Dylan those photos, and Dylan got upset. Uh, Dylan got on the phone with his brother Corey. He was texting with Corey, and then Dylan walked out of the hotel room. And the defendant shared with you that, that he was aware that Dylan had been texting with Corey as a result of that discussion. That's correct. And that Dylan was upset and angry about it. Yes. Did the defendant share with you that that was the last time they'd seen one another before this November Thanksgiving trip? Yes, the defendant said, however, the defendant said that while Dylan was away when he walked out of the hotel angry. Uh, the defendant looked at his phone and saw the messages to Corey. He talked to Dylan when Dylan came back and said that it was right for me to show you those photos because those are poor conditions, and that even made Dylan more upset. So because of that interaction in August, there was not much communication between the defendant and Dylan prior to this visit. And you used the pronoun he. Are you saying the defendant had looked into Dylan's phone and found those messages? That's correct. What was Dylan's reaction upon finding that the defendant had gone into his phone and seen the text messages that he'd been sending to Corey on that August trip? He was upset. He being? He was sorry. Uh, Dylan was upset. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, that continuing conversation you're having with the defendant on November 26th, what did the defendant tell you verbally about the dinner choice and how that came about? We didn't go much into detail besides uh, what Mr. Redwine said, that he wanted to go to a nicer restaurant. Dylan wanted to go to McDonald's, so he let Dylan choose. They went through the drive through got McDonald's, and then drove to Mr. Redwine's house. Did you ask the defendant to provide detail as to the rough housing a little bit that he referenced in his written statement? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that, please? Yes, he actually demonstrated for us, uh, sorry, the defendant demonstrated for us what happened. He said that he and Dylan were passing the football back and forth between couch to couch, and Dylan would run over, and the defendant would say, I would just grab him with my arm and push him into the couch. He said nobody was hurt, and uh, he motioned that at least once, maybe twice. So he, he called that roughhousing of them tossing the football back and forth. And you remember him saying that no one was hurt, no one was injured at all? That's correct. And that would, given your role in this case, be something you'd focus on, of course? Yes. What did the defendant tell you Dylan was doing on his computer devices during that time? He said that, uh, well, first of all, he said the, defend, or the defendant said that uh, Dylan went upstairs when they got home, got the DVD player, and they put in the movie called Adventureland, which uh, Mr. Redwine had purchased for him at Walmart. And Dylan was watching the movie, he was texting some, and he was messing around on his laptop during the movie. Let's turn to November 19th. What did the defendant tell you in this November 26th conversation? It took place on the morning of November 19th. So yeah, we had walked through the, the picking up at the airport and. Uh, Dylan going to sleep that night, and then uh, Mr. Redwine continued to the next morning, and he said that he woke up at about 5.45 a.m., Mr. Redwine did. He went in and saw that Dylan was still asleep, uh, just like in his written statement where he said he stirred around. He said he tried to make a little noise uh, to wake Dylan up, but Dylan did not wake up. And so Mr. Redwine then went to go see an attorney and went to his job for a while. What did the defendant tell you he did in terms of calling or texting Dylan during that time? 
that he both called and texted Dylan to see if he was up, and Dylan did not answer the calls or the texts. Approximately what time did the defendant return to his home? 11.30 a.m. And what did he observe upon returning home, according to what he told you, November 26th? Uh, the defendant said the TV was on to the Nickelodeon channel and a bowl of cereal was in the sink. But Dylan was not there at the residence. Where did the defendant tell you he thought Dylan might have gone? He thought he went fishing with a friend named Tristan. And what did the defendant do at that point? Uh, the defendant uh, took a nap. For a while, uh, he said, I don't remember which statement, it was around 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And then he decided to go look for Dylan after the nap. And where did he go and what did he do? Well, he first went to Tristan's house and he was unable to locate Dylan or anybody there. He then went to another friend's house and then he went to the Bayfield Marshal's office. And did he also call Elaine Redwine after arriving at the Bayfield Marshal's office, according to the defendant? Yes. What did the defendant offer to you as a possible reason for Dylan's disappearance? He said that he thought Dylan went fishing and he thought he might have run away. What reason did the defendant give for Dylan running away? He said he might have run away because of Elaine. What was your reaction to that, Agent Grusin? Uh, again, I was not... I was not taking a confrontational role with uh, Mr. Redwine, uh, but I did not understand why Dylan would go from Colorado Springs to uh, Biocito, and then if he had problems with Elaine, run away from Elaine while he's at Mr. Redwine's residence. So I did ask him that question. I said, why would he run away from Elaine if he's at your residence? What did the defendant say? Uh, that's when the defendant started talking about the poor living conditions, and that's when I found out about the August trip that he had shown the photos to Dylan. Did you also ask the defendant for consent to search computer devices within his home? Yes, I did. Can you tell us about that, please? Uh, we just asked him, you know, whatever, because he told us Dylan was both texting and uh, on a computer, and we were able to the defendant gave us consent to search those items as well as, I believe, a, a laptop or iPad he had. And between the written statement that you read to the jury as well as the conversation you just shared with us here, any mention at all about injuries that Dylan was suffering? No. The only thing was the rough housing, but the defendant was adamant he was not injured during the rough house. Any mention of blood at all from the defendant on this November 26th interview? No. What stood out to you about the written and oral statements on November 26th as you decided what steps to take next in your investigation? Well, I thought the, the August uh, incident where Dylan got upset and did not talk to him for a couple months was important. So I wanted to talk with the brother, Corey, to see what happened between them. And then, of course, the defendant was saying Elaine was responsible, so I wanted to talk with her, even though it didn't make sense to me. I wanted to see if that is a possibility. How long did you spend with the defendant on November 26th, Agent Grusin? About two hours, I think. What were the next steps you took in the investigation? We, myself, uh, the agent with me, the, the investigators, we went back and we met and we briefed everybody on what happened. Uh, Elaine and Corey were in town and I made an appointment to meet them at the sheriff's office the next day. And we just, we talked on next steps and I, I had uh, left uh, you know my contact information with Mr. Redwine I said I'm available anytime you want to call I said our goal is to bring this to a conclusion to help find Dylan you call me anytime so uh, that's how we left and then you know I, I spoke with Elaine and Corey to verify the stories that Mr. Redwine told me. What did you learn from Elaine and Corey in regards to those particular points? Um, Actually, Your Honor, it's not for the truth of the matter asserted. It goes to what Agent Grusing does next with regards to the investigation and its follow-up interview of the defendant. As long as it goes to a follow-up interview, I think that's okay. Thanks, Your Honor. Go ahead, Agent Grusing, please. So I spoke with Elaine, and she said it 
that there was a lot of um, fighting between her and the defendant. She said, however, Dylan was a very easy kid to raise. Uh, she said that he's very social and she cannot see him being without his friends. Uh, she also said that Dylan was not looking forward to this visit and sent her a frowny face upon his arrival at the airport. So I also spoke with Corey. I asked Corey about these texts and what was going on during this August time frame. Uh, Corey confirmed uh, what the defendant told me that Dylan was upset about being shown the pictures of the windmill property, but he asked Corey for pictures of the defendants with feces on his face. And Corey told me that he had those photos, but he did not give them to Dylan when he asked for them in August. And was the reason you were asking Corey about this because of the information you learned about the defendant going on Dylan's phone? Yes. Let's turn now to November 27th. What's the next step you take in regards to the investigation into Dylan Redwine's disappearance? Uh, myself, the Agent Humphrey and the investigators went back again to contact Mr. Redwine at his residence to just walk through the timeline again and see if we could get some more detail on what happened. What's the reason you wanted to go back and do that again? I wanted to see if anything changed in what he had told me on the first day. I wanted to see his uh, reaction to us showing up. I mean, it is very normal for me to spend days and days and days with a family when someone disappears because they often want our help to find their missing kid or wife or whatever. So we just make ourselves available on a daily basis to continue the communication. Approximately what time of day did you arrive at the defendant's house on November 27th, 2012? It was around the same time, either late morning, right around lunch, or early afternoon. Was the defendant home when you arrived? He was. Can you tell the jury about that interaction, please? The defendant answered the door, and he was holding a pillow with both hands. Uh, his eyes were very red, as if he had either been crying before or drinking. Uh, he was more disheveled and distraught than the first day, and he said he'd had a rough time or a tough time. And what else did he say to you at, during that first interaction on November 27th? Um, he, he wasn't upset with us showing up. I, I think he said the pillow was something like this might be the last item Dylan touched or laid his head on or something like that. What did you do then? We sat down with him and about just like the previous day and spoke with him on the couches and just asked him to walk us through things again for anything new he might remember, uh, that sort of thing. What, if anything, did he provide you with regards to the trip that they had taken to Walmart on November 18, 2012? He provided me with a receipt where he purchased the, the DVD, The Adventureland, and the other movie for Dylan. And did you then have another conversation with the defendant about the timeline and the interactions between he and Dylan on November 18th, 2012, and what the defendant said about November 19th, 2012? Yes. And what did he say to you during this November 27th conversation about those dates? His story was pretty consistent with what he had given me the first day on the 26th. What did he tell you about uh, text messages, if anything, that Dylan had been sending on his way from Walmart back to the defendant's home. Yeah, I believe he said this is more of the Dylan wanting to get together with his friends. Uh, and so he said Dylan was texting his friends on the way. Who else was present in the defendant's home during this conversation on November 27th? His brother, David Stone. And what interaction did you have with Mr. Stone, if any, during this time? Uh, well, I, I reintroduced myself to him, told him the FBI's role, you know, and told him why we're working on behalf of the family and how we're going to do this. I gave Mr. Stone my business card and said, you know, same thing, the door's always open, et cetera. So uh, we brought him in as well. And in speaking with the defendant on November 27th, his story, was largely consistent with what he'd said on November 26th. That's correct. How long did you spend at the house on the 27th, Major Gerson? It was not as long, maybe an hour or hour and a half. And when you were leaving the defendant's house, how did you leave it with the defendant? I asked 
the defendant or Mr. Stone to please contact me, you know, when something comes up, if we'd like to talk further, et cetera. You also make plans to meet the next day, November 28th? Yes, as I said, we'd like to meet with him daily and could he please call me when it's a good time to meet. And what'd they say in response to that? I don't remember exactly, but I don't remember them telling me no. They did not, however, call me the next day. So let's move to the next day, November 28th. You're saying you didn't get a call from the defendant or David Stone? Correct. So what steps did you take? Uh, starting the morning of the 28th, I worked with the sheriff's office to start drafting a uh, search warrant for Mr. Redwine's residence. What was the reason you wanted to get search warrants for the defendant's residence, Agent Gerson? Well, multiple reasons to see if we could uh, authenticate uh, Mr. Redwine's story, to see if there was a, a sign of a violent confrontation there in the house, if something might have happened, to give us any other clues of, of why Dylan was not there. There's there's a lot of things to look for. So we, we had multiple reasons to get a search warrant. And what was the process for going about getting a search warrant for the defendant's residence? I just assisted the local investigators in drafting an affidavit, and then they got the warrants and presented it to a judge. Did you have any conversation with the defendant on November 28th, Agent Gerson? I did not. What steps did you take to check in with the defendant and or Mr. Stone about whether they were willing to talk with you? I called Mr. Stone at around 3 o'clock and asked him if they were still interested in meeting, and he just told me they were still thinking about it. So I just left it at that. So let's turn to November 29th, 2012. Can you tell us how that day began in terms of this investigation, Agent Gruson? So after getting the search warrant, we met real early with the Sheriff's Department. Our evidence response team had come in to help process the scene. And uh, we, we developed a plan of action. And then we were up at the defendant's house by about 8 or 8.30 in the morning. What was the plan of action going to be for November 29th? So during a search, if you have your house searched, you cannot be present inside the house during the search. So you have to either stand outside or go to a, an office or wherever else. And my plan was just to be with Mr. Redwine while the search was happening and see if we could talk some more. What was the reason you wanted to do that? I wanted to see what his reaction was to know that the FBI was searching his house. So can you tell the jury about your arrival at the defendant's home on November 29th and what took place then? So uh, during our planning meeting, I asked our evidence response team to drive the, the truck up. There's a lot of space in front of the defendant's house, but to drive it, I don't know, 50 feet or so away from his front door, but so he could see the FBI seal and our truck, it's a big white truck. And the, the purpose for doing that is going to be the same thing that I explained to the defendants, and that is when we do a search for something like blood, hair, fibers, saliva, it's going to be very thorough. And I explained that to the defendant when he answered the door. I, I told him we had a search warrant. The truck was behind me, and I said, we're going to be searching the place. We're looking for any sign of Dylan here. And I told him, you know, the, the, those items that I described before is what we would be looking for. What items? It's uh, anything. It can be uh, hair, saliva, blood, especially, you know, signs that Dylan might have been injured in any way. Now, you met with the defendant on November 26th and November 27th, and he had never mentioned any blood or injuries to you during those two conversations and three, including the written statement. That's correct. Where were you interacting with the defendant when you first arrived at his house on November 29th? At his doorway. We were at his doorway or slightly. In, he was, might have been stepped outside a little bit as we were talking to him, advising him of the warrant. And what was the reason you wanted the truck, the evidence recovery team truck, parked within sight of the defendant's front door? Well, I, I've worked other cases, and sometimes we don't find anything, but sometimes they being if someone was responsible for a violent act, they might admit uh, something anyway, knowing that we, we might find blood or something that had been cleaned up. And you explained to the defendant what the purpose of the search warrant was? I did. Did you explain to him what the truck was there for? No. 
What did you say you were going to be looking for in connection with the search warrant? Well, I explained that the truck was our, part of our evidence response team. I didn't tell him why it was parked there. So Understood. Yeah, but no, I, I explained to him that our evidence response team had a job to do, and you know this was going to take a long time. I asked him if he'd rather stand outside or we could go to the office, the FBI office, but I'd like to talk to him some more. And he said, well, if you say it's going to take all day, I'm not going to stand around all day, so let's just go to the office. So he and Mr. Stone went with us to the FBI office in Durango. And how are you going to get from the defendant's house back to Durango? Uh, I wasn't going. Oh, oh, sorry. From the defendant's house to Durango. Yes, the sheriff's department had a suburban or something like that that we got in the back seat of. After getting in the back seat, what did the defendant say to you, if anything, Agent Grusin? Um, after I had mentioned the statement about finding blood and our response team is there, it, it's either as we're getting in the, the suburban or we're, we're once in the suburban, he said that Dylan had a cold sore or an ulcer on his lip that was oozing blood. So that was the first mention of any blood I had heard from him. First mention of any blood you'd heard from him in the three days you've been interacting with him. That's correct. And as far as you know, is that the first mention of any blood that anyone from law enforcement had heard in the 10 days interacting with him? It was. What was your reaction after the defendant said Dylan had a cold sore that was oozing blood in response to the search warrant that was going to be executed? Well, I, again, I'm trying to work collaboratively with the defendant at this point, and I said, well, that will be easy to verify because Elaine will be able to say there was a cold sore before he put, she put him on the plane, and the flight attendant most likely will have seen a cold sore if it has blood in it. What did the defendant say then? He said that he changed his mind, and it was not from a, a cold sore or an ulcer. It was when they were tossing the football back and forth, and Dylan had tried to catch it, and he had missed, and the football had hit him in the lip and blood had gone on the floor. Was that different than anything he had said previously? Correct. What did he say Dylan did in this version after his mouth started to bleed from the football hitting him in the face? I don't believe we addressed it right then. I think I didn't want to question him. I'm in a suburban right now, back seat with other people, and we were going to talk at the office for quite a while. So it was, again, Significant, I thought at the time, because he was admitting there was an injury to Dylan, and I decided we would just address it later. What was the significance of his story changing from no blood, to cold sore, oozing blood, to football hitting Dylan in the face, causing him to bleed to you? Well, both stories, the defendant was changing uh, what had happened to Dylan to meet what he thought would be evident. The, the truck represented evidence collected from the scene that would be collected. And then when he mentioned the cold sore, and I said, well, I could track that down pretty easily, he changed the story to the football. Any further conversation in the suburban at that point? No. So where did you go? We went to the FBI office in Durango. Can you tell the jury where you went when you arrived at the FBI office, please? So. Uh, I've only been there once or twice, but you, you walk in, there's just kind of an office area, and then there's an interview room or a conference room uh, to the left, and myself and Agent Humphrey and Mr. Redwine went in there to further discuss the timeline, and of course I wanted to, to get to the bottom of what happened to Dylan's slip. And did you then have another conversation with him in that conference room? Yes. Can you tell the jury how that conversation began, please? So we just uh, told the defendant, uh, again, that we wanted to go from A to Z, that we wanted a little more detail on each one of the things, that we're trying to build a, a really solid timeline for uh, the sheriff's office, and we were just trying to find Dylan. And that was also more of a sharing process where we were sharing parts of the investigation with him, and we wanted him to share a little more with us. What did the defendant tell you in terms of the timeline in this conversation with you on November 29th? Uh, the first part was basically the same as far as uh, picking him up from the airport, the Walmart. He did he did offer that Dylan wanted an iTunes card at the Walmart, that the defendant did not buy him one, and Dylan got a little 
not greatly upset, but just a tad more upset about not getting an iTunes card. Um, we walked through the McDonald's, uh, even what they had ordered, that sort of thing, and then uh, the drive back to the residence, uh, watching the Adventureland movie again. The, a lot of that was mostly the same. During the movie, however, he said, the defendant said that he went and wrote a, a check for child support, uh, which was new. I mean, uh, we were asking for every detail he could remember, so it didn't really jump out as, to me as something odd. But then uh, the time he went to bed was about the same. The time he woke up the next morning was about the same. In this conversation on the 29th, where did he say they were positioned in the living room while they were watching the movie? Um, he said that uh, Dylan was on one couch and he was on the other couch and they were throwing the football back and forth. And this is when he told me the football was a Nerf football, which is the first time that he said that. He had never given me the detail. He just said the football. So he also described the football scene and he said when, when Dylan missed it, he spat blood on the floor. And Mr. Redwine said, don't do that here, you know, that sort of thing. So that his story was Dylan had gotten hit in the face with the football, the nerf, causing him to bleed, and then Dylan spit on the floor. Correct. Did he also tell you again that he had roughhoused with Dylan on November 18th, 2012? Yes. And how did he describe that in this conversation? He again said that they roughhoused, but Dylan was not hurt during the roughhousing. It was throwing the football, like you had said before. What did he say about November 19, 2012? Uh, the defendant told me the same timeline that he woke up at 545, uh, that he, he did see Dylan over there. He added, and again, we were trying to get him to add details, and he added the detail that he saw a backpack open and some black shirts on the floor. He said something to the effect of, I'm not, I'm not your mom, I'm not here to clean up after you, and he, he got the shirts, black shirts, and put them back in the backpack. He being the defendant, saying that he himself put Dylan's black shirts back in his backpack. That's correct. And what did he say to Dylan at that time? Something like, I'm not your mom to clean up after you, words to that effect. And that was what the defendant said took place on the morning of November 19th. Yes, but right. Dylan was not awake to hear those words. What were their tentative plans for that morning at around 6.30 a.m., Agent Grusin? Uh, the plans was, uh, sorry, the plans were for the defendant to take uh, Dylan over to Ryan Nava's house at 6.30 in the morning. And instead of taking Dylan to Ryan Nava's house at 6.30 in the morning, what did the defendant tell you he did? He said he went to work and went to the attorneys, and just like before, he tried to call and text Dylan and came back home at 1130. Do you recall which way, which route he took to get back home at 1130? Yes, he said he went through Bayfield. What was the reason he said he went through Bayfield to return home on that day? He said he went through Bayfield to see if he could see Dylan on the way back. Anything that strikes you about that? Well, Bayfield's quite a ways from his house in Viacita. Did you say it's about 20, 21 miles? Correct. What truck did the defendant say he was driving on November 19, 2012? He said he could not recall if he was driving the Chevy or the Dodge that day. And again, does he then take you through what time he arrived at home and that being around 1130? Yes. In this conversation on November 29th, what else did he tell you about his arrival home? He said that when he got home, uh, Dylan was not there, so he looked for the fishing pole for, in three logical places for about an hour. And that search for the fishing pole, according to the defendant, took an hour? Correct. What did he do after that hour-long search for the fishing pole? He took a nap. And did he again mention that he checked Tristan's and Fernando's houses for Dylan and that Dylan had not been seen at either? Yes. What did he tell you at this point about going to the Bayfield Marshal's office and what they did in response to the defendant's visit there? I believe he said they, they put out a, the defendant said Bayfield put out a missing or endangered person notice for Dylan. 
That's what the defendant told you. Correct. What happened at this point of the conversation, Agent Grusing? At once, once uh, he had went, run us through the timeline again, uh, I started going through with the defendant of what he thought might have happened to Dylan presently, as far as the world of options that he figured. What were those options that you discussed? Well, he said there's less than a 5% chance that Dylan ran away. And in our first conversation, he said that's what he thought happened, this Dylan ran away. So that's fine. But then we went on to, well, the, we, again, were working with Mr. Redwine, saying that we had canvassed the neighborhood the sheriff's office had. We don't see a sign of Dylan walking down to the lake. When you say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say you don't see a sign, what are you referring to? There was a canvas for video, any video footage from uh, the Red Wine residents down to the lake. And was and, it, go ahead, sorry. That's okay. Uh, and there was no reports or film or anything of Dylan walking in that direction. So go on, please. So we went from then him running away to possibly a stranger abduction. And I said, we've done a thorough neighborhood. Actually, the sheriff's department had already done that and we don't see a stranger abduction. And Mr. Redwine agreed with that. So at this point in the conversation, he's, he's saying less than a 5% chance that Dylan would run away, although that's different than what he said two or three days earlier. And he agrees with you, seems a stranger abduction is not possible. Correct. What happens next? So then I don't recall if it was myself or Mr. Redwine that introduced, you know, the next thing, and that's that a wild animal got Dylan. And, uh, I interjected, I believe it was me that said, well, what, what a bear? And Mr. Redwine, uh, he got animated and said, yeah, there are bears around here. A bear could have got him, or words to that effect. And uh, my son was a year younger than Dylan at that time. And I said, Objection, uh, relevant. Uh, why don't you ask a question? We'll see if it's relevant or not. Sure. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent Grusing, after the defendant became animated about the possibility of a bear attack being the reason that his son is gone. Objection as the form of the question. Well, we, well there's, there's no question yet, number one. And he's explaining when uh, he's referring to the agent to, so it's fine. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. So what was your reaction, Agent Grusing? So Mr. Redwine's reaction was not what I expected when I posed what if a bear took your son. And what, I told him what do you mean by that? He got excited, almost animated at the possibility. And that struck you as what? Objection to ask and answer. We're now retreading this ground. Um, retreading this ground. Overruled. Go ahead. I just found it an odd statement, being a dad myself. What was your reaction? Objection moved to strike. That was the exact same answer as prior and the um, relevant objection prior to that. Well, I think it is relevant. You're talking to somebody. You're noticing what you think is odd behavior. It leads you to do an additional investigation. If you're a law enforcement agent, it is something that the jury can consider. They don't have to accept it, but it is relevant. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. What happened next, Agent Cruson? So... At this point with Mr. Redwine, we had exhausted the possibilities outside of him for what happened to Dylan. And I told him that I had worked a lot of cases like this and I did not think that he, when Dylan came to town, he intentionally meant to harm Dylan. So I said an accident probably happened and we need to start talking about what happened. What's the reason you said that to the defendant at that point? Objection, Your Honor. The basis for this speculation is not admissible. Overruled. Go ahead. Agent Grusin, you just explained what you said to the defendant at this point in the interview. What was the reason you were saying that to him at that point? I wanted the defendant to tell us what happened to Dylan, and I told him that he could either cooperate with the investigation and let us know what happened, or he could get in the way of justice as it came down upon him. Objection moved to strike. That's a, the, the get in the way of justice remark from the FBI is, is not admissible evidence. It's being offered to 
try, I mean, the agent did it to try and get a statement from Mr. Redwine. I think it is admissible for that purpose. Go ahead, Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Your Honor. So what specifically did you say to the defendant at that point, Agent Gerson? Well, I've used an analogy before with people in, in his uh, position that it's like you're on the side of a mountain and a big boulder is about to fall on you. And you can either get out of the way or you can just let it roll down upon you. And that's just a, a picture that I gave him to say you can help us with this thing or based upon what we know to date, the investigation, your statements, et cetera, that you know, eventually justice is going to come. Your Honor, objection to this line of questioning, these answers, and move for the court to provide a limiting instruction that that might be a threat that the FBI offers to citizens in trying to intimidate them, but that's not something that can be considered for the truth of the matter. It certainly is not something that a jury can consider that that's what's going on or that's true. It's uh, solely being uh, produced to you to understand uh, the defendant's reaction, the defendant's statement, and uh, why this agent did what he did. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. And upon explaining this to the defendant, Agent Grusin, what was his physical reaction? Uh, the defendant leaned forward and his shoulders slumped and his head went down. And we just let him think for a while. What did he say? He eventually said, I've got to think about myself. And was that the last statement that he made in that interview? He was. It was. Sir. I have nothing further for Agent Cruising. Thank you, sir. Okay. Cross. <clears throat> the remark about the likelihood of running away that was made several days after you arrived in town, right? That's correct. So at that point, it makes sense that Mr. Redwine is reassessing based on time passing. Yes, he could be. You mentioned telling Mr. Redwine that there was film of the street and that that was something described to him, but that was more of a technique, right? That was not a true statement. That was a, an effort to get Mr. Redwine to talk, right? No, at that point, we had no video of Dylan walking down that road. Right. And ultimately, law enforcement did seek to get surveillance footage from people in the area, and that surveillance footage did not show the road. So you're not making a statement of fact in describing what you told Mr. Redwine. No, I'm saying to the best of my knowledge, we had no film. And again, I'm not out doing these things. We are meeting together as a group. And that was a question asked. Is there any trail cams, ring doorbells, that sort of thing that, that show Dylan walking from the house down to the reservoir? And there was none. So, so the jury shouldn't take that to mean that there's some film out there showing County Road 500. Objection on or asked and answered? That's fine. <laughs> well, if you're going to let me do it, I'll, I'll... Just to clarify, so could you answer that question? Sorry, what was the question? That, that there's no film that you're aware of of County Road 500, right? Correct. And in a similar vein, um, part of having the backdrop of the big FBI evidence response team vehicle behind you is to signal to a citizen that the federal government is now here. Yeah, he knew we were there from the past couple of days. But yes, the, the purpose of that was to let him know that search was going to be very thorough for Dylan. And that there would be a lot of resources brought to bear. Yes. And that was, in fact, something that you were describing to him that alternate light sources will be used and, and other <laughs> techniques. A lot of techniques are going to be brought into your home. Right? That's correct. One of the resources that the Federal Bureau of Investigation would have available to it is recording devices. Agreed? We, at that time, we did not record our interviews. That wasn't my question. You had available to you recording devices, correct? Yes, we did. 
the conversations that you're describing with Mr. Redwine and the characterizations that you're giving to that conversation is not something that we'll be able to listen to our, on our own because at the time, the FBI was not recording conversations, right? That's correct. Has there been federal legislation passed that requires that these sorts of conversations be recorded in the interim? I don't know about the legislation, but starting a couple of years ago, if we're assisting a local agency, especially, we are to record along with that agency's uh, procedures and protocols. You mentioned, um, and I, I don't know if it was something that you were catching, folks who've been sitting in this room for the last several weeks would be aware of the fact that a call to Elaine Hall might catch someone in this room's attention. But what Mr. Redwine was in fact saying was that he reported his concerns to the marshal and to the child's mom. Or are you standing by the notion that it was a call as described by Mr. Redwine? I, I couldn't tell you the difference between the two at this point. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Mr. Redwine was adamant that Dylan was not injured in the days leading up to the November 29th conversation, right? Yes. But again, that adamant is something that you're assigning to it and we'll never be able to listen to it to, to determine for ourselves, right? That's correct. And Mr. Redwine said, and, and I, this was left out, so it stands out to me, but Mr. Redwine says that there might have been an injury to Dylan, right? When did he say that? <clears throat> on November 29th. Correct. After he's, you mean after the lip sore thing? Well, I'm having to rely on things you wrote because there's no recording of these interactions. But what you Objection, wrote, Your Honor. I, I agree. Just try and keep your editorial you comments uh, to yourself, Mr. Moran. But you can just provide him with what he wrote if, if uh, it's different than what you're hearing from his testimony. Do you recall writing in your? FD-302, that's what the FBI calls police reports, right? Correct. And you wrote in there that Dylan was not hurt but might have gotten a cut, right? On the 29th. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look? Sure. Approach new approach. Yes. Yes, it does. Back in 2012 when this was written and it had to be signed off on by another special agent from the FBI who was present, um, you wrote that Dylan was not hurt but might have gotten a cut, right? Correct. And the testimony today was that Mr. Redwine said that there was something. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, the characterization of spitting that, that you've given to what was described to you, this jury shouldn't understand that Mr. Redwine was describing Dylan hawking a loogie, like drawing up spit and just spitting all over the living room, right? He said he only spat in one place. Like. He didn't demonstrate for me, though. Um, you had not reviewed text messages between Dylan and his mom on in November, had you? No, I had not. So you wouldn't have been aware at that point when it was standing out to you that Dylan would have come from Colorado Springs and then run away, um, that, in fact, Elaine had been saying, Elaine, the child's mom, had been saying, uh, make your dad wait, that kind of thing, when Dylan arrived in Durango. Did you know that that kind of acrimony existed? I knew there was acrimony. I did not see that text. So that specific thing you weren't aware of, but you did know that between Elaine Hall and Mark Redwine, there was very significant <coughs> acrimony. Yes.
you had some discussion about Dylan's brother, Corey Redwine, and your interactions with him on direct. Do you recall those questions? Yes. And it's fair to say that the conversations you were having with Corey informed next investigative steps for you? They assisted, yes. To include Corey's statement that he didn't think that his father would harm his little brother, Dylan? Yes, I don't think either Elaine or Corey thought that he was going to harm Dylan. When you were in Mr. Redwine's house, were you able to smell decaying bodies? I was not. Did you see uh, indication of significant efforts to clean, for instance, smelling bleach, pine salt, anything of the like? No. <laughs> Up until the point, you, you mentioned on, on direct that you wanted to avoid being confrontational for the first few meetings with Mr. Redwine, right? Yes. But there was a point when you decided that confrontation was necessary, and that's when you start talking about boulders rolling down on him, right? Yes. And the full weight of the FBI sort of sentiment being provided to Mr. Redwine. I don't think that's how it was characterized. That is an impression you mean to create, starting with ERT truck behind you and moving through saying to Mr. Redwine things about boulders crushing you, right? Yes, again, my goal was to find Dylan, and I did not believe he was being honest with us, and I felt that if I was able to show him that the truth would come out somehow, maybe he would change his story. So, so. intimidation was uh, is a way to put that, right? Objection, Your Honor. I'm pretty sure the witness didn't just say that. No. Oh, uh, this, uh, this is a characterization from the defense, and he, you can answer whether or not it was intimidation or anything else, and the jury can decide what this tactic consisted of. So it's, it's fair. My, my intent was not to intimidate Mr. Redwine. My intent was to get him to tell the truth. And, and I'm not one to <laughs> yell at people or scream at people. Uh, I thought that using an evidence truck and saying the search would be thorough and talking to him about his options would help him help us find Dylan. Working for the Federal Bureau of Investigation since 1996, you've become aware in the course of your career that people, individuals faced with that sort of power, the power represented by the FBI, do on occasion feel intimidated. Yes. And after the confrontational description, or after the confrontational interaction began and the description of the boulder happened, that's when Mr. Redwine for the first time starts saying, I need to start thinking about myself. Yes. Right? And up until then, his focus had been on providing you information about Dylan Redwine, right? I, I know you interpreted it differently, but Mr. Redwine was giving you information about his son up until then, and that's when he stopped, right? He was cooperating with our investigation, yes. So the confrontation happened at the end with Mr. Redwine. Correct. Thank you, sir. Nothing further. Redirect? Yes, Sean, thank you. Agent Grusing, uh, throughout the days that you were in Durango assisting La Plata County Sheriff's Office with this investigation. Were you getting regular briefings from the other investigators at each one of the agencies on what was taking place? I was. And was that some of the information that you were using when you were interviewing the defendant? Yes. And some of the information you were using, excuse me, when you were highlighting for the defendant why his story or stories did not make sense? Correct. And you pointed out that at the time the FBI did not record their interviews? Yes. If the interview had been recorded, what would the jury see? Well, they would see Mr. Redwine. I asked and answered. I'm not sure. Uh, what would the jury see? So let's, let's see what your answer is. 
Well, they would just see us talking to Mr. Redwine and, and him demonstrating the rough housing. Uh, they would see him demonstrating the throwing the football. They would see him demonstrating the, the lip and, you know, the sores and those sorts of things. And in an effort to document the interview, were you and Agent Humphrey also writing down notes throughout the interview? That's correct. And did those notes include the defendant saying in the final version that the football had hit Dylan in the mouth, causing him to be injured, and Dylan then spit blood on the floor? Yes. Objection leading mischaracterizing. Mis There's another part to this straight from the report as asked on cross and left out on first direct. Oh, you had your cross. This is redirect. I think it's fair. Go ahead, Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Your Honor. So you took notes during the interviews? Yes. Yes. And did you then type up a lengthy five-page report about the November 29th interviews? Yes, we did. Counsel asked you if, def if the defendant's focus had been on providing information to find Dylan. Do you recall the, that question, that line of questioning? Yes. Did you believe that focus, that information, to be 100% truthful? Your Honor, permission to approach if, if this question may be allowed. Assessments of, of truthfulness are to be made by the jury. Um, this individual, Mr. Doherty, want to respond to that? Sure. Your Honor, counsel just asked Agent Grusing on cross-examination, wasn't the defendant focused on and had been providing information to find Dylan to complete the context of why Agent Grusing then follows up with the defendant. I think it's relevant for the jury to know Agent Grusing's understanding of those statements and how they compare to the other evidence in the case and compare to the previous statements the defendant had provided to the FBI and all the members of law enforcement in the 10 days leading up to that final interview. Okay, I think the jury has heard all of that. Uh, I do think it is a comment on truthfulness, and so I'm going to sustain the objection. Counsel asked you. Counsel asked you a number of questions about the federal government is now here, and the search will be very thorough. Correct. The federal government arrives. The search is going to be very thorough. And what does the defendant say to you on November 29th for the first time to any member of law enforcement since Dylan went missing? Objection to this officer's special agent's ability to comment on what any officer knows. I think without that part of it, it's probably a fine question, but. Well, he can, he can answer the question as to himself. It's the first time he admitted there was an injury to Dylan and that there was blood from Dylan. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you, Agent Cruci. Questions from the jury? Okay, Agent Grusing. Um, Mr. Redwine mentioned that Dylan was upset because he could not go to his friends. Uh, so Dylan went off to the video section of Walmart. Uh, have you seen the text? That's with a question mark. I'm, I think the, the real question is, is, have you seen the text to Ryan then after uh, that happened? I have not. Okay. To the best of your knowledge, uh, where in the house uh, did Dylan spend the night? on the 18th of November? On the couch. In the living room? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Um, did Mr. Redvine uh, say the Marshal's office uh, had sent out a missing persons alert? I don't remember the exact term of the alert he said they put out at this point. I don't think it was missing persons. It was... It, it, I guess the other question being, I don't care about an exact term, but did he say they did something or not? Yes. What did he say they did to the best you remember?
He said they they acted on it somehow, and I can't remember the term that he said, but it was some sort of proactive step they took. It was okay. still on his they need to hear it, not me. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, did, you, did everybody hear that? He took some sort of proactive, the, the marshal's office took some sort of proactive step, um, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. I don't think they entered him into the system as a missing person or something like that. And did you ever follow up on that yourself? I did not. <laughs> you did not? Okay. Any follow up on that from you, this Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Agent Grusing, is there anything that would refresh your recollection as to what the defendant said that the Bayfield Marshal's Office was doing in response to the defendant's visit to the Marshal's Office? Yes, it would be in my report. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. On what page are you referring Agent Grusing, does that refresh your recollection? Yes, it does. And what did the defendant tell you the Bayfield Marshal's Office had done in response to his visit there? What they called a, well, a wellness check. And that to you was a flag that they were taking some action? Correct. According to the defendant? That's correct. And just to clarify, the defendant's statement to you was that Dylan had slept on the couch in the living room that night. Yes. You're on nothing further. Thank you, Agent Kirsten. Mr. Ray. And as you were aware, when Mr. Redwine said that, Bayfield Marshal's Office, the Potter County Sheriff's Office, the Potter County Search and Rescue, all of those agents, agencies had done something that could be considered a wellness check. Right? They were out at Mr. Redwine's house. Agreed? Yes. Okay. And that happened on the 19th, right? Yes. And you weren't in town for six days later. <laughs> That's correct. So when Mr. Redwine's telling you that there were proactive steps taken, that's accurate. They were taken that very day, law enforcement search rescue at Mr. Redwine's home, correct? Yes, I didn't verify that with Facebook. Um, And based on what you understand about this case and investigation, um, Bayfield Marshall's office did follow up, right? I don't know. Thanks. Let me. All right. Anything else from the jury? Can this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Agent. Prosecution's next witness. Your Honor, people have completed their case in chief. Okay. So you're resting? Yes, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a couple things that we're going to need to do uh, before we go any further, so it's probably a good place to, to take a break for you. So we'll let you out a little bit early uh, tonight. Once you're back here tomorrow at the same time, uh, 10 to 8, we'll start as soon as we can uh, after 8 o'clock. Again, uh, please do not discuss this case amongst yourself or with anyone else during the course of the trial. Do not initiate posts or respond to anything about this case on social media. Keep an open mind throughout the trial. Reach your decision only during your time of deliberations. Do not permit any third person to discuss this case in your presence. If anyone uh, attempts to do so over your objection, please report that to me. Uh, don't attempt to gather any information on your own. Don't engage in any outside reading on the case. Don't visit any places mentioned in the case. Don't read about the case in the newspaper or obtain information about it from the radio, television, internet, social media, or any other source. Don't try and learn about the case in any way outside of the program. So, uh, thanks for your attention today. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. The record can reflect that the jury has left the courtroom. Are there any motions? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes.
get to the microphone, please? I'm just informing the court there is a motion. We just need a moment to prepare. All right. Your Honor, to uh, orient the court to the basis for our motion for judgment of acquittal, I want to focus the court's attention on count two, the child abuse count. Um, as the court's aware, the evidence that would support either one of these charges in this case is, is the same. Um, and we do not have we don't have a, a manner of death. Um, so there's nothing that would support multiple theories of conviction on each issue. There's two components to what we're going to ask the court for here with this motion for judgment of acquittal. First, to ask the prosecution or order the prosecution to elect which theory they're proceeding on because their evidence is going to be same on both. Is it, is it, hold on. Isn't an election done at the close of the case as opposed to now? Uh, well, they, they just said that they've closed their case. Well, you're going to not present anything? Depending on how your honor rules here, well, if, we may that not. That wasn't my question. If I rule against you, are you going to present any evidence? Uh, that's judge. That's the question. I'm, that's the question. I, I, I'm not aware that I, they have to elect until we start doing instructions. So that's an instruction issue. Mm -hmm. Well, against us, are we going to present the case? That's the question. Yeah. Sure. But then we'd be going in. Okay, so we're not going into instructions. So I, I'm, I'm not sure this is the proper time to bring it. But go ahead and make your argument. Um, so that that issue is highlighted for for counsel um, and for your honor. The other issue there is that what has been described, what's been provided to the jury, is that there are curve marks on the zygoma. Zy that would not support the way count two is charged, wherein there's um, reckless or knowing unreasonably placing a child in a situation that could pose a threat of life, or injury to life or, or health of a child. I mean, we, we all know what that is, leaving a kid in a dangerous situation. It is not dismemberment and blunt force trauma resulting in death. So, that's an, another part of what we do not think should ever go to the jury. So the defense moves for judgment of acquittal on on that count um, to start with. The issue is whether the relevant ev evidence, both direct and circumstantial, when viewed as a whole in the light most favorable to the prosecution, is substantial and sufficient to support a conclusion by a reasonable mind defendant is guilty to be charged beyond a reasonable doubt. On that theory, the only thing that would support a conviction would be um, guessing, speculation, or conjecture. And the court's obligation here under the Due Process Clause of the United States and Colorado Constitution is uh, to not allow that count as charged to go forward. So, that's our record on that count with respect to uh, count one. We'll rest on the record and we move for judgment of acquittal. All right. Response from the prosecution? Thank you, Honor. Now I'm going to ask you to deny the defendant's motion. I am also prepared in just a couple moments to rest on the record. I, I know the court's been obviously paying very close attention to the evidence and I would ask the court to flag for me if you have any particular issues or concerns so that I can address those. 
My general approach here, Your Honor, is to not go on for a half hour unless the court has a specific concern, which I would then, of course, address. Just a couple quick things. First, uh, counsel correctly shared the standard that the court is required to view the evidence, and that's in the light most favorable to the prosecution. Uh, counsel misspoke when he said there's been no evidence regarding the manner of death. Obviously, the manner of death here has been described as a homicide, and that was yesterday by Dr. Kurtzman. I think counsel may have meant uh, no evidence regarding the cause of death, so I'll just address that. No, and I, I understand. So just very briefly, Your Honor, it's not required to prove either charge that we have a specific cause of death. If we did, we'd have a whole lot of murder cases never getting prosecuted in the state. Uh, here we have the manner of death offered by Dr. Kurtzman. We have evidence of cut marks to Dylan's head. We have evidence regarding blunt force trauma found on the cranium and all the other evidence that the court has paid such close attention to. The standard uh, here, and also since the state of mind, the element required is knowingly. I think that's clearly been met by the evidence at this phase. I also think if there's any question about the jury instructions to be read, that the court's right to put that off for a later date. But at this time, I'm prepared to rest on the record again. I trust in the court would alert me if you had any questions or issues, Your Honor. I don't have any, excuse me, I don't have any issues. Thank you, Your Honor. In the light most favorable to the people, uh, the court uh, does find there's sufficient evidence on both counts one and count two for this, uh, both counts to uh, continue in the trial, to continue on both counts. Uh, I understand there's quite a bit of circumstantial evidence, and it's almost all circumstantial evidence against the defendant. I'm sure that's something that's going to uh, be raised on closing argument, uh, but it's just as good and has carries just as much weight as direct evidence. Uh, the evidence about the skull being somewhere different, the distance that the skull was from the uh, the rest of the remains, the kerf marks, which now uh, indicate a sharp tool, would also indicate that um, the body was uh, was tampered with after, after death. Uh, it's extremely suspicious. Mr. Redmine is the last person to have seen the defendant. There's also evidence at the house. There's his actions, and there are um, all sorts of, of, uh, of, there is motive evidence that's, that's present. I'm not saying any of this is just positive. I don't know what the jury's going to do, but I have to look at it because it's, I have to look at it, uh, again, in the light most favorable to the prosecution, and I'm not to wait and use this evidence. So I'm going to deny the motion and we'll start up tomorrow then close to ABC and get started. Anything else? Your Honor, I'm going to talk with counsel after we break today just to get the lineup of witnesses, which I really appreciate us having the opportunity to go over, but I don't think we need to do that on the record, and otherwise, nothing further from the people. Thank you. Your Honor, what, the last thing from us for today is that there was a, a ruling pre-trial with respect to a Frederick Miller, a gentleman who wrote, Your Honor, a letter to say that he was on Middle Mountain Road, thought it was... Um, Hunting season was off by a day. Our, our position is that that was a mistake born either of just getting the dates mixed up or um, under threat of possible prosecution for poaching you know, you know, that he no, changed his no, mind. I'm not going to let you argue this and argue this. We've been through it. I've written an order. He specifically said it was the last day of hunting season. It was presented to you that hunting season stopped on the day Dylan at 5 p.m. or Sunday, excuse me on the day Dylan arrived, and he claims to have seen him uh, before Dylan could be out anyway. And so it's impossible. I'm just confused. That's how I ruled, and you don't get another bite of the apple. I, I, we just didn't want to lose the issue for failing to raise it at this point, and based well, on... You, you've already raised the issue. I know you guys think that, but it's kind of a silly position. So it, it's the only thing that you can tell, and I understand you think you need to do it. You can understand my reaction. Your Honor, and I'm sorry to have annoyed the court. I can see it on the expression on your face and how you responded to me. Um, based on the evidence that's provided and been provided in the people's case, that's why we believe we have to renew this, having seen the lacking memory of every witness, I think, who's hit the stand about things that happened in 2012. That's why we believe it necessary to bring it back to Your Honor's attention and also the necessity of contemporaneous um, raising of issues. No, no, don't argue with me about whether or not you have to raise it again, okay? That's okay. kind of annoying me more, so don't bring it up. I, I do not want to annoy the okay. court any further, so that's the reason we're raising it. I understand Your Honor's ruling. Um, All right, we'll wait Proceed, Thank you, Your Honor. Have a good night.